Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Giantomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International New York, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, DDG, Friedman LLP Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Herrick Feinstein LLP Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Corman Communities, a.k.a. Hotels, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, Sterling & Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. How many people say, I want to be a producer? <laughs> I don't know. How many people want to be actors, directors, producers? There aren't that many, and I haven't had too many. And I'm really lucky to have my friend Paul Living today, who is with the Jamson Theaters and the Broadway League and the Circle in the, in the Square to be here. Thanks for coming today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Mike. So let's talk a little bit about your parents because you, you, your mother and father have an interesting life and how your father came over. Tell me about your parents. Well, uh, in the family uh, history... Uh, if you go to the genealogy, okay. <laughs> uh, my dad, and, my dad uh, was in the Tsar's army during World War I, uh, captured by the Germans three times and escaped by the Germans three times. He fought from the beginning of the war to the end, returned back to his little shtetl in uh, Russia, uh, met my mom. It was not a prearranged marriage. Uh, they fell in love and they got married. And uh, it was after the revolution uh, and my dad was in charge of a small little warehouse where there was food kept and other essentials for living. And that was his responsibility. But uh, things were rough and tough and meager and people didn't have uh, the resources to buy things and it would break in at night. And word had come down that the uh, Bolsheviks were coming to inspect the little town. And my father and mother and my father's father, my great-grandfather, or my, great, my grandfather, who I never met, uh, were all decided that it was fearful for them to, uh, him to be in the situation the next day because there's no knowing what could happen. He could be put on trial, he could be shot, he could be taken away. Uh, my father was not a gambler. <laughs> he said to my mother, who then, by that time they already had one child, my sister, my older sister, Ray, and my mom was pregnant with my other sister, Dorothy. And my dad said, uh, I'm going to leave tonight. I'm going to go to America. And when I get to America, I'll send for you. But what happened with the counterfeit ticket? Well, he went to, he went to Latvia. And uh, he worked, saved up enough money, uh, bought a ticket, went to the boat, <laughs> He had been scammed. It was a counterfeit ticket, so he had to stay in Latvia and work uh, for almost a whole year to get enough money back to get a genuine ticket, which brought him to America. And, he, and the ticket brought him to Ellis Island. Ellis Island. He went through Ellis Island. He's registered in Ellis Island, 1922. And he, he's in New York. He's, he's in, in New the York. hat business? He's doing well, he's he not in the hat business. No, he's, he, was, he's he worked in a hat, hat factory. factory right? And... Uh, you know, it was, it was really interesting because they had all these wonderful organizations that I really, yeah, part of federation to support 
uh, immigrants coming into the country. So, you know, you come off the boat, someone greets you, they find you a place to live, they give you some spending money and arrange for you to have some food, help you find a job. He got a job, he worked here, saved. He had relatives in Chicago, uh, and he went to Chicago. He never communicated once he left directly with my mom uh, in any letters or anything, but through other relatives who were writing to family back in Russia, uh, there would be word that he's in America, he's now settled in Chicago, he's got a job, he's got another job working in a hat factory and uh, did some other small light manufacturing, accumulated some money, arranged, well, first everything had changed in the immigration law at the time, so now he had to become a naturalized citizen before he could send for his wife and children. So he had to learn English, and uh, one of the treasures of our family is made these little bound Shakespeare, leather Shakespeare books. King Lear and Romeo and Juliet helped him learn English with a little inscription, property of Eli Libin, my father. Uh, he could speak German, he could speak French, he could speak Russian, he could speak Yiddish, he could speak Hebrew. He was pretty, not, not e highly educated, but very well informed and had a linguistic capability. Uh, he, and they secured a job as a milkman driving a horse and wagon. Now, your mother comes over in 28? My mother comes in 29, two days before the stock market crash. And the family joke was they were very fortunate. They sold all their stock holdings and equity holdings before the crash. So they came here with a, a pile of now, money, you, you, a pile you, of money which was about this thin. So you said to me, so the family, your mother... And then subsequently in 1930, you were born. I'm born in 1930. Okay. Uh, and in 1930, you were born, and your father is delivering milk in a, in a buggy. Uh, in a wagon in a with wagon, a horse. A horse uh, over there. And what's interesting uh, later on is that um, they, say, uh, they say that you have to become a, a driver. You have to have no, a they don't. They, they don't tell them what you have to become. At the end of a week on a Friday, as the story was shared with me uh, years later with my dad, all the, all the milkmen were called in, and they asked if anybody had a driver's license. A few men raised their hand. They had driver's licenses. They said, come with us, and they said to everybody else, wait here. They waited a half hour, about 45 minutes. An hour later, the foreman comes in. He says, you guys are fired? On Monday, we're going to deliver milk with trucks. So he lost his job. Tell me about growing up as a kid in Chicago. You know, you with your two sisters. Tell me about your, what, what you did before you went to work with Dad when he changed careers, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. Right. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we always grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, ironically, uh, uh, some time ago when I was in Chicago, I went back and looked at the places we lived at. The, the buildings are still there. The neighborhoods have changed. They're more upscale now. Different ethnic populations live in those neighborhoods. Uh, we lived in a small uh, apartment building, three stories in Chicago where I, was, I grew up. We had relatives on the second floor. They were the rich relatives. They had a telephone. And uh, that telephone serviced that whole side of the building. We lived on the first floor. If there was a phone call from my parents, there was a knock on the radio, one knock. Long pause, another knock. That meant my dad and mom had to go upstairs to get the phone. The third floor, there was a three knocks, long pause, three knocks. It meant for the wallers, they had to come down to the second floor. Uh, there were just marvelous things. I, this, one of the stories they told me as a little boy was uh, we had a radio, and it was in a big piece of furniture, small little radio, but it probably stood about four or five, probably five foot high. It was the zenith or the Philco, yeah? Whatever it was of the day, probably one of those two, correctly. And uh, my mother comes into the living room, and I'm pulling this away from the wall, and she's screaming at me, what am I doing, what am I doing? And I said, I just want to see the little people in the radio. So that was my first uh, encounter with the theater world. But you, th you also encountered with the theater world came out that you went to the Yiddish theater, right? Didn't you? I had I had gone to the Yiddish theater. Well, I didn't go. My parents took no, me. No, your parents took you. Yeah, to the Yiddish theater. Not, not to be left alone. I, I went along. I remember seeing the, the most memorable. Two things happened that are most memorable. 
I saw Maurice Schwartz in a Jewish Yiddish production of Hamlet, which went on and on and on. And when it was over and the curtain call and he received an extraordinary applause, uh, he stopped, went to the foot of the stage, and then reprimanded the audience for failing to support the Yiddish theater. And he was vehement in his attack. And I'm listening to this, and I say to my father, why is he doing this, Dad? <laughs> why is he yelling at us? We're here. And my father says, who else can he yell at? <laughs> They're the only ones. Now, so and then I also saw Tony Curtis in a production right, when he was a Yiddish act, he worked in the Yiddish theater in Chicago. Now, what's interesting is, so Dad, because he didn't know how to drive a, a, an automobile, then goes into uh, the grocery business, like a little, a little place, a right? A small little grocery store next to a, a small little grocery store and a kind of luncheonette uh, across the street from a high school. And you, your and mom I, and Dad were... Uh, my mom and Dad worked there night and day. And then uh, they had the, the kid work there part-time also, didn't they? Yeah, I remember, I remember my sisters who were then married, uh, one to a city planner, uh, all PhDs, and my brother-in-law, who was an a optometrist, uh, uh, you know, all professionals, and my sisters were professionals. And Passover holidays, they would always come to fill the Passover orders uh, in this little grocery store, which was uh, surrounded by all Yiddish families. And uh, my father would say, I have the most educated grocery clerks in America. So when you were growing up, Besides the fact that you went to the Yiddish theater, you really didn't know anything about acting in the theater? No, no, no. I had no interest in the theater as a youngster at all. Even as a teenager, I had no interest in the theater. Uh, as things evolved in my life... Um, we'll get to that in a second. So you graduate high school. What year is it now? 47? 1949. 1949, you graduate high school, and then you, you enroll at the University of Chicago? Illinois. 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 And you don't even know, what are you, what are you going for at this time? Uh, you know. Liberal arts? Liberal arts, I mean a liberal arts program, a general studies program, University of uh, Illinois, which had a branch in Chicago, in, Chicago, in, the, in the heart of Chicago, uh, which was created when all the GIs came back from World War II because there was such an influx under the GI Bill. And I started studying there. What my, one of my interests, keen interests at the time was what was happening in the world and international relations. And part of, part of what I was kind of exploring in my mind or kind of having a goal to reach for was that I, I wanted to uh, spend a couple of years at the University of Illinois. Tuition was, you know, literally, you were, it was free because you're a resident of the state. And my plan was if I could secure a, a transfer to the University of Chicago, which had a very uh, highly regarded international studies program, that's what my, I thought my destiny would be. So then you and your buddy double date and you go to the theater. Tell me about that. Because uh, that was the changing... I, I don't even know. know uh, I have never been able to recall what prompted me to go other than we decided to go on this double date and we decided to go see Death of a Salesman. I suppose we must have read something about it at the time or it was heralded in the printed press at the time. Uh, of course, television was not what it is today. And uh, I remember watching this extraordinary play just unravel uh, before me and totally uh, engulfed in the subject matter and the performance and the theatricality of it. It was a production that had gone on the road, uh, directed by Elia Kazan, Arthur Miller, the author, and the starring actor in the, in the production was Thomas Mitchell, famous American actor. And, and you, you got the bug. And you said to your friend, I'm going to be an actor. And no, I, I, no, actually, I didn't share anything until I came home that but night. What, but there was something that happened. Right, with a hat. With, with, yeah, what comes happened, out, right? What happened the, the was a wonderful memory out. of our conversation we had. What happened was my friend went to get, he borrowed his father's car for this double date. We now had moved to an area called Albany Park, which is on the west north side of Chicago. Uh, moved the transition from Humboldt Park, which was an all Jewish area, to a more somewhat same Yiddish fa Jewish fa area, but surrounded differently and uh, 
little upscale compared to where we were when we first uh, inhabited uh, the Hummel Park apartment. Uh, so he goes to get his father's car, and I'm standing here with my date, who I can't remember who she was, uh, and his gal friend. And from backstage of the Erlanger Theater in Chicago comes Thomas Mitchell. And his collar is up, his brim is down, it's a cold night. And I say to myself, oh my God, Willie Loman is alive. <laughs> Willie Loman is alive. I said, I said, he's real. He's real. That's my destiny. That's what I have to do. I have to do that. So, I don't know what possessed me so to do that. you go home and you tell your parents that you're going to be an actor and your father says, Julius Caesar? What was it? <laughs> no. My dad said, Paul, every six months you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Yeah, because at that time you wanted to do a boat. Yeah. A bunch of us got together when we were restoring a sailboat. And the plan was we were going to take a little time off from college and sail down the, Ch the Chicago River, uh, uh, the Chicago into the Illinois River, into the Missouri, into the Mississippi, sail so, around the Caribbean so you for gave a while, up sell sailing, the boat. You gave up sailing. I gave up sailing for a life in the theater. So was it summer stock first? Then I did. I applied for summer. Well, I got involved in the theater at the University of Illinois. They had a little kind of amateur group. You know, you know not, not part of a study. Not, there were no studies in the theater. But there, and I volunteered to be in a, in a play, actually, which was, I was an extra in Julius Caesar. Uh, and then, uh, you know, well, that was it. I mean, once I was on stage, there was nothing stopping me. Uh, and uh, it's one of my friends who I met there said, why don't you go to summer stock? And I started writing everybody's summer stock. And the trick then was you had to make up some background that you had some experience. So I, you know, over-elaborated on my experience. And uh, I received uh, an acceptance in a small summer theater in Walden Bridge, New York, it's Walden, near Bal Albany, and so yeah, it's below, yeah, a little bit in the Pittsfield, Pittsfield uh, area, uh, and uh, so I went there as an actor. Well, you, w you, you went were as lighting designer. You, you, you were did everything. everything. Yeah. You, you did everything in Summer Stock. At least the one, I, one, I, the three I went to, and I was in a play, and I got nice reviews, and I thought, oh, this is I'm so, in heaven. So now, how how do you end up in Columbia? I mean, this is to New. Well, once I decided that this is what I have to do, I. I put all my efforts to come to New York because I felt that was where the theater was. I'd, I'd studied a lot about it. Uh, I remember reading all about the group theater and all the magical things that they had undertaken to do and all the people who were involved in it. Uh, and I had no desire to go to California. So, I mean, some young actors, even in those days, went to California. I had to go to New York. That's where the theater was, the serious theater. Uh, I think and you I, get to the Upper West Side, which, is, which was always theatrical yeah. also. A lot of and, famous and people have Columbia uh, over yeah, there. I get to Columbia. They Gertrude, Gertrude Lawrence story, <laughs> a five hundred dollars scholarship. Yeah, boy, you've done your research. Um, I'm a student at Columbia, an acting student at Columbia. I have a school of dramatic arts, and uh, Gertrude Lawrence was then in the King and I, at the St. James Theater, which is where my office is now, uh, at Hugh Jamson Theaters on top of the theater. Uh, and uh, she comes up to Columbia to teach uh, uh, an acting class. And uh, what I presented in the class and meeting her, she chooses a couple of people in the class to get the Gertrude Lawrence Acting Award. And that was the first time my picture appeared in the New York Times, which I thought, well, from this day forth, they'll just be clamoring for me to be working on Broadway as an actor. Uh, I didn't get any calls. I did auditions. I did more summer stock. I got a $500, there was a $500 uh, Stipend, check, and it was a lot of money in oh. those days. And then, then your, 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 your school is interrupted by the war, of Korean War. Well, it, it's, it's really interesting. When the Selective Service Act was in, uh, enforced in those days, you had to always uh, keep the the Selective Service System. Right, and you were you're Chicago a, based. Right? I was Chicago, I had, but now I was living in New York. I thought, well, I'm living in New York. I immediately go and I change my address to where I'm living in New York. And a month later, I'm drafted into the Army and I'm trying to protest that I, I got to go back to school. And they say, oh, you'll, you'll get to school after you get out of the Army. So you spend time at Fort Hood and you get involved with some theater work over there. Yeah, we started, I actually right. started and you a theater did, group. You did one major production of the detective story. And then you come back, you, gra you finish Fort Hood, and you come back to Columbia to finish your... Yeah. Fortunately, though, 
when I got drafted in the Army, it was at the tail end. At the end, end of the war. At I the mean, end of the war. <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm not a Korean veteran, but I almost was a Korean veteran. Otherwise, you know, hey, it's better. You, 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 you put your time in. You come back, you finish Columbia, and what happens? You, know, you don't want, now you say, I, 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 I want to be an actor. I want to be a producer. I want to well, be involved. Well, when, when I got involved uh, with that theater group in Fort Hood, Texas, there was something thrilling and exciting about putting the parts together. I directed it, I designed it. I designed, we got a couple of desks and we made some flats. I, I lit the show. There was something about the whole aspect of production that just got me very excited. Uh, although I'd been involved in some of that, those activities when I was at Columbia and certainly was involved in some of those activities when I was in summer stock. But this was the first time I was actually uh, making the decisions. So, so I was saying, this is what we're going to do. So this is how we're going to do it. How do you meet the guy who had his, his office and production center in the Dakota? Oh, well, what happened then was there was a man, uh, there was a wonderful man named uh, Edward Cook, called Cookie, Edward Cook. And he ran a big lighting company in New York where all the equipment that was used to light the Broadway shows, uh, he supplied that. He either purchased it or rented it. And he, when he taught that course at Columbia, I took it because I wanted to know about lighting more than what I just learned at the back of my hand. And uh, uh, he had an exam, and I got an A-plus in the exam, and he wrote a nice little note, and he said, all the room is at the top, which I thought was kind of very inspiring. So when I graduated Columbia, I called him for an appointment, and he was eager to see me. And I walked in and I told him, you know, I'm now graduated. I need, I'm looking for work. And he said, come work with me. I'll give you a job. Five dollars a week, right? Not for him. I didn't work for him. Right. He's Cook, I said to him, I didn't want to work in a lighting company. I wanted to be involved in production. And he called uh, Joe Melziner, who was the most, he was the eminent designer of his day, uh, having sh uh, designed shows like... South Pacific, Mr. Robert, Death of a Salesman, Streetcar Named Desire, uh, King and I. I mean, literally hundreds of plays. Uh, he was the most, he was the foremost des uh, scenic designer of his day. He also did the lighting. He did everything. He didn't do costumes. And uh, he said, uh, Mr. Cook picked up the phone when I said I, was very grateful for the opportunity that he offered me, but I was more interested in production. He called Mr. Melziner, and he said, I have a talented young man. It, it would be really nice if you could see him, Joe. And, and Joe said, well, they're talking to one another on the phone. I'm putting this together in my own mind. He said, send him down. So his office was on 43rd Street and about 10th or 11th Avenue. So I walked all the way back over to Times Square and got up to the Dakota, which was on 72nd and Central Park West. And this marvelous old building that I knew about but had never been in. I uh, walked through these exalted marble halls and stuff and dark wood paneling. And Mr. Melzina was very welcoming and I talked to him for a long time. And uh, I could see some of the great shows that he designed because things were on the wall. And uh, he said, when would you like to start the work? And I said, now. And that was it. I was hired as a gopher. My job was to get the mail, deliver the mail, uh, go deliver messages if they had to, get coffee, tea, whatever people needed. Whatever had to be done, throw out the garbage, whatever it was. So let's talk about the Martinique Theater, 32nd Street. A group of us worked together on that show when I worked for uh, Joe Melziner called Happy Hunting, Pat Ziprat worked as an assistant costume designer. Ming Cho Lee worked as an assistant. Ming Cho Lee, Ward Baker, worked as a production assistant. We decided to do an off-Broadway play. And, and you're there for 20 years, close to 20, yeah, 20 years. years. The first play we did was Arthur Miller's The Crucible. Later on, in like 1961, you meet your, your partner. 63. 63, you meet your friend and partner, Ted Mann. Ted yeah. Mann comes in one day. He's doing a, he wants to do a production of six characters. We start talking about it. He wants to rent a space because the place that they have down in the village in Sheridan Square is occupied with their current productions. And uh, we're talking and talking, and somehow in that conversation we say, well, we'll do it together. 
and we shake hands and become partners. And so you've been involved with the circle since 1963. Right. And you became the president of the circle. I am now. Ted has passed on my colleague. He, he and I were partners on a handshake. On a handshake for 50 years. So, you know, over, over those years, and, you know, and then it's, you know, you're involved with the circle, you're producing, you've done over 250 production, and Rocco Landsman sees you. you. There was an article in the New York Times, and then tell me about Rocco and you, because that's how you got Well, Rocco wrote teams. a piece for the Times where he talked about the the producers on Broadway were the Schubert's, the Nederlanders, and Drew Jampson. I didn't know Rocco very well. I got upset about that, and I thought the other producing organization really should be Lincoln Center because they were doing all these things up at Lincoln Center with Joe Papp and uh, all the activity there. And I wrote a rebuttal, and of course the Times printed a couple of a couple of tiny little paragraph. And Rocco, who's a wise and informed gentleman, said, uh, "I know you didn't write a little paragraph. I'd like to read your piece." And I said, uh, "Rocco, you don't want to read it." And I didn't send it to him. And so the next time he saw me, he sent, I finally sent it to him. He said, well, I don't agree with you, but... And the next thing I was, I get a phone call from him one day. He said, why don't we get together? And I said, uh, what, what about? He said, well, I want, I'd like to talk to you. I said, why don't we just talk on the phone? Yeah. And he said, no, no, I want to have so dinner he finds, with So finally has dinner. You go to Brooklyn, and then uh, you finally join Rocco in 1990, right? 1990. And... Over those, over, since 1990, you know, you, Rocco, Joe Jamson, Jordan Roth, you know, you, a couple of Tonys. You've won nine Tonys? Nine Tonys. Some of those productions include? Uh, Angels Rising in America. Dolls, Angels in America, uh, Love, Valor, Compassion, Proof, uh, Circle and Square. We got one for 25 years of continued great performances. Let's talk about uh, day in, day your out. wife. My you beautiful met her wife, Florence. 56 years, right? And we've been married for 56 years. We have uh, three wonderful children, adults now, and two grandchildren. Uh, Florence and I just met and fell in love instantly. How did you uh, meet Florence? Uh, <laughs> she. Uh, we only have 30 seconds, but. <laughs> no, uh, some people tried, my friends tried to fix me up with, who at the time I didn't know was her roommate, and I said, I don't do that. And a couple of months, about a few months later, they. They, they said they were going over to a friend's house for some dessert after they invited me for dinner. I went with them, and then suddenly I realized that this was the young woman they wanted to fix me up, and I got kind of very upset, and I was actually getting up to leave. I looked at my watch when I figured that out, and, I, and in walks Florence. And, and I'm introduced to Florence, and I say, well, I'll talk to my friends tomorrow, and uh, we start talking. I call her the next day. We have a date. That's May of 1956. And we got married in September of 1956. So, you know, let, let's look at She's it. She's my best partner, nope. my best advisor. She's always given me encouragement and strength when I've needed it most. And some of those productions that you've been, you really uh, have been your children would be the producers, Book of Mormon, uh, the... Um, Angels in America, Death of a Salesman, two times, one with George Scott, one with uh, Brian Dennehy. Uh, so there's so, just so many plays. It's so, it's one of the things that's extraordinary. You work with the greatest people in the world, Rex Harrison, Vanessa Redgrave, Raul Julia, Kevin Klein, and Al Pacino, uh, Dustin Hoffman, way back. You know, those are the things that are the and, memories and, 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 and the rich. And that's why Broadway is great. And that's, that's why, and that's why I'm so happy that, you know, for the, the kid who grew up in Chicago, who, you know, got lucky and came to New York, has built a great career. And thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Great to be with you.